The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Michelle Hunter. I'm the Director of Marketing here at Burlasoft, and I want to thank you for joining us for migrating to Salesforce Lightning, understanding the technology and benefits. Today, Bijan Sadehi, our Technical Architect and Services Manager here at Burlasoft, will be reviewing Salesforce Lightning technology and the benefits it brings to your Salesforce functionality. Before we begin, I want to let you know that this webinar is in listen-only mode. There will be a Q&A period at the end of the webinar, so we encourage you to submit all questions in the question box so that we can address them at the end. And Bijan, I will hand it over to you. All right, well, thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, my name is Bijan Sudegi. I'm, I'm a technical architect and technical services manager at Bielosoft. Uh, and today I will be walking you guys through Salesforce Lightning, uh, trying to get a little bit better understanding of the technology and also the benefits that it can bring to your org and how best we can utilize uh, this technology in our org. And also uh, talking about how we're uh, approaching Salesforce migration uh, to Lightning for our clients. So speaking about our, our methodology and our uh, practice around uh, the migration to Lightning platform. So before I start, uh, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about Bielosoft our, and our Salesforce practice. Uh, we are a platinum consulting partner with Salesforce. Uh, we're one of the top 10 Salesforce uh, partners globally with over 3000 projects delivered. Um, we work across uh, various different uh, verticals, manufacturing, media, and entertainment industry, finance, insurance, healthcare, aviation, and energy and services. Uh, we have over uh, 500 uh, certified resources with a, a great CSAT score of 9.3 and, um, and recognized by uh, quite a few uh, different uh, uh, places like YouTube Crowd and others. So uh, <clears throat> a little bit about our practice, just uh, to make you guys uh, more familiar with our uh, uh, expertise in the Salesforce area. So uh, by that, uh, let's just start with the uh, uh, first thing that comes to uh, most of the client's mind when, when we start talking about Lightning. So, so when they start thinking about Lightning, they, they always come up with a lot of questions. And we realize in our experience that they often need help to understand you know, what, you know, what Lightning is all about. And uh, okay, you know, with that, you know, how, how do we properly take advantage of this platform? Well, the other question that we often hear is that, uh, what is the proper way to migrate to Lightning? How, how do we break down this migration to phases? And, uh, you know, even if we do that, you know, where, where do we start? And how do, how do we start? And how do we plan and roadmap? And how do we estimate and budget for this? These are the questions that we typically, uh, face when when we start uh talking with the client about the lightning migration and frankly th these have been kind of a you know um uh, uh, i guess uh hard questions uh, to get answered for wherever you know uh the clients go uh to get help with their uh, lightning migrations so uh for that um uh, i thought uh, it, it's best if we start with uh, asking the question of what is really lightning uh, most of you have heard about lightning experience and Salesforce uh, uses the term experience for the new uh, UI for the Salesforce, the, the, the user experience or user interface of Salesforce that is up, updated. Uh, and I'm sure most of you have seen it um, and uh, is, is kind of a standard uh, UI today for Salesforce um, and it's called lightning experience. You also have heard about the Lightning Platform. Lightning Platform is basically what empowers Salesforce to provide the Lightning experience to you. And that's something that you can use to build the same experience that comes as standard with Salesforce and to build custom um, functionality on Salesforce. And also you have heard about the Lightning Design System which is basically a set of guidelines to make sure that uh, your custom uh, functionality uh, integrates seamlessly with the, with the uh, standard experience that's provided out of the box with Salesforce. But 
having said all these three areas, um, what really Lightning is, is actually uh, a uh, new technology framework. So overall, you know, that technology is what uh, enables the experience platform and design system. So um, most of uh, clients, when we talk to them, um, they're not aware of that technology and they're not aware of what really is that underlying uh, change that happened in Salesforce. And today I will be uh, specifically talking about that underlying technology and uh, you know how how that has changed and uh, with that understanding hopefully we would be able to make better decisions of how, how we can take advantage of that and basically maximize our ROI uh, and from our investment that we do on on this uh, technology so um, this is a, a very interesting uh, diagram uh, about the web technology evolution. So one of the things that enables this new technology is uh, the direct effect of uh, web technology evolution. So if we look at this diagram, there are a lot of uh, little things here. I'm not sure if you can read uh, if you've got a little smaller screen, but but really starting from 1991, which, which was basically the birth of the web technology and HTTP protocol, and uh, you know, early 1992, when the HTML version one came in, and the mosaic uh, basically uh, browser came in, all the way to uh, you know what, what technology looks like today. If you look, you know, we start we start having uh, some of the you know uh, very famous uh, browsers starting around 1994, 95, and 96. Uh, some basic protocols started uh, to kind of getting shape up. And uh, as time passes by, you know, you see HTML starts growing very rapidly from the first version to all the way HTML4. Then they, we had a period of time over the few years that pretty much nothing really happened except some of the upgrades to the existing uh, browsers. But then again, you know, starting 2003, 4 time frame, we start getting a lot more attention to what web can do beyond just the basic uh you know exploring the web and um and and you know as we move forward in 2005 six seven we start getting some of these new technologies like uh svgs canvas and http xml http uh requests and things like that so i'm not going to go into the details of these technologies but as you see as we move towards the right hand side of this diagram we're getting a lot of these technologies uh you know introduced to the web, which basically empowers web to do a lot more than just exploring, uh, you know, static web pages. So um, if um, I want to summarize uh, this evolution, I can say uh, the web evolution was based on three pillars of, um, you know, technologies. Uh, one as being very important uh, is the JavaScript evolution. So uh, JavaScript started supporting things like document object model uh, scripting, which allows you to manipulate uh, what's being displayed on the page right, you know, right from the page itself. Um, introduction of AJAX, um, you might have heard about that, asynchronous Java, uh, which is basically uh, using the XML um, HTTP request, which allows you to uh, directly call from the server from within your web page, and also addition of some security features uh, that allowed the JavaScript to be a lot more power powerful than what it was. The second pillar was the HTML evolution itself. So um, HTML5 came out with a lot of different uh, new uh, features that were missing for years. So um, we, we see a lot of things uh, like new structural elements uh, in the HTML. I'm not going to go into the details of these, but, but just know that a lot of these attributes like, you know, supporting um, new uh, attributes like numbers, date, time, calendar, supporting SVG and Canvas, I showed you in a diagram. The multimedia elements for, for a long time, if you remember, uh, we had to have a plugin installed to do videos on the web, but, but nowadays, uh, you know, you, you don't need any of those things. You can directly um, watch videos in the web. And that's the, that's the, one of the, you know, those are one of the features of uh, basically HTML5. The geolocation to kind of track uh, where you are 
Um, also the drag and drop local storage, which allows you to store information on the browser itself, application cache and things like that. So um, just, just summarize a little bit about HTML5. And the third pillar was basically the CSS, which is cascading styling shit uh, uh, for evolution, which basically uh, I can name it as CSS3 was a big change from what CSS1 and 2 was. And things like, you know, you see a lot of those on the web, like round a corner, shadows, gradients, uh, transition animations, and multi-column layouts and flexible box and grid layouts. So basically, uh, these three uh, pillars made the web a lot more powerful than it was in the past. On the other hand, we uh, faced hardware evolutions. Uh, when we look at the hardwares, uh, you know, back in, uh, you know, early 2000, we really didn't have much uh, different form factors. We had desktop computers and laptop computers. And um, from a form factor, they were, they were very close. You know, we had, you know, quite, you know, maybe just a couple of inches of the screen differences, but, you know, maybe laptops were a little bit smaller than the uh, regular displays. But really, there wasn't much of a uh, change. But then as we move forward, you know, uh, in time, uh, in late 2000, you know, uh, like around 2008, eight nine, we started having the mobile devices introduced. And, uh, and uh, you know, very quickly, we started seeing a lot of changes and a lot of different form factors and sizes. And as you can see on the screen, you know, we started seeing the iPads coming in, you know, different phone factors. Uh, and laptops and, you know, desktops, and then, you know, also TVs came into the picture. So um, we started seeing various different clients, of course, with different um, processing capabilities. But, but again, you know, uh, it started making web very complicated. Uh, one of the things that uh, people needed to do was, okay, if I need to have a website or web application, I need to support all kinds of different devices because people will use their iPad, they will use their phone, their internet, their web on their laptop or desktop computers or even on a TV to, to visit the website or the web application. So, so it made it very difficult um, with, a, with a traditional web to build applications that will support all of these devices. But, um, but then again, you know, this hardware evolution uh, also came with a more uh, processing power, right? So um, we're seeing that uh, our even phones are a lot more capable of some of the laptops that are out there or some of even the desktop computers that are out there. Um, it, it quite, it's quite amazing uh, knowing that, you know, some of these uh, processors that are um, built into that tiny device is how much processing power they have and what, they, what they're capable of doing. So, so that hardware evolution, along with the web evolution, basically gave birth to an idea of saying, okay, with, with more powerful clients, uh, why don't we let the clients decide about what they want to show and how they want to show it? Instead of um, the programmer to try to build a website that will you know, serve different clients, they started thinking about, okay, you know, let, let delegate that, uh, you know, a functionality to, to our clients. For example, you know, you have the tablet clients, mobile phone clients, laptop client and desktop clients, let them decide what they want to show. If the tablet is a small or if the mobile phone is even a smaller than tablet, uh, why don't we let that device to decide uh, you know, between like 10 elements on the page, maybe maybe the four most important elements should be displayed on those uh, form factors. Let, let those devices decide what they want to show. And with that, the server would be basically turning to a just dummy service provider. Essentially, a uh, uh, think about it as, you know, um, like an expert that you will go and ask the question and then you decide how to build your presentation. So the clients will get the information from the server and then decide how to display that. But the server really at that point of time would not care about what the client is or how the client wants to show uh, those information, right? So essentially the server turns to a, uh, uh, turns to a uh, basically system that only provides data and also it can provide some automations and services like, you know, let's say AI analytics and uh, connectivity and things like that. So at the end of the day, the presentation will be moved completely, uh, the responsibility of that move will be moved completely to the client side and server will be just providing the data. And with that, 
uh, we started seeing uh, the introduction of uh, the concept of single page application. You might have heard this, um, you know, in different places, uh, SPAs or single page applications. But what that is, is basically um, they, they took the idea of having uh, empowering the clients and decided that, okay, why don't we uh, create uh, an application that would be only one page? In a traditional web, uh, every page required a call to a server, right? So the way that used to work is if you look at the diagram on the left-hand side, um, the traditional website is that, you know, the, the way it works is that you call a URL, which is the address of a web page, you get the content of the web page coming to your client. And then again, when you go to the next link, when you click on a link, the new address will be sent to the server and then you get that HTML for that address and you see it on the page. The, the problem with this model is that every time you go to a new link, everything from that web page needs to be kind of re-downloaded from the web server. And what happens is you're going to see that gap in between the two web pages where your screen turns white until you, know, you get the second page loaded on your screen. And this basically, uh, prevents you from doing things like transitioning animations and fluid kind of experience of moving from one web page to another, right? And, uh, and it basically uh, turns to a, a little poor user experience. But then uh, the concept of single page application um, is that um, why don't we uh, load the whole uh, content of a web page one time and then when a user clicks on a link, internally within that web page, we decide to hide certain elements and show certain other elements, which allows us to do transition. It allows us to do things like animations and allows us to not reload the whole page and basically avoid that white blank page. And that's what basically is you, you see on the right hand side. So we load the whole web application at one time, which probably will take a little bit longer time, but that basically what we call like bootstrapping, which basically loads all the content. And then when you navigate and click on different links, you're not actually sending a new address to your uh, web server, but instead internally, you're asking the web server to load certain components that's, uh, that's based, that are needed to load that page. And once you get that content, you essentially modify the existing web page within that web page using this, the, the three things that I mentioned, basically the JavaScript, HTML5, and CSS3 to make the web page look like a different page, but you're not actually reloading that page. This experience allows you to do, again, you know, things um, a lot more smoother. Um, transitions would be a lot more seamless and a lot more uh, user friendly. All right. So um, with this architecture, um, client and servers are pretty much very independent, right? Uh, again, you know, that's, that's the same idea, right? We wanted the clients to be more powerful. The servers would be uh, basically dummy service providers. So, um, so we basically make this client and server pretty much very much independent. Um, and after the initial page load, the server basically, you know, as I said, it will act like a, just a service provider and we'll let the client to handle how the page is going to look like. And then, you know, from there on, any interaction with server will be done through Ajax calls, with, which will happen within the JavaScript. And then even uh, the routing, which means, you know, going from one web page to another will be all handled internally to the page. So the so benefits of that, and as I said, you know, uh, you, you will end up with a much more fluid and responsive design or experience, and uh, you know you wouldn't have that you know uh, jaggy uh, or jarring effect between the web pages, and a browser will just become loaders and things that you and usually see on the browsers like the history refresh back and forward buttons start to become obsolete, right? These, these functionalities on the browsers were there, you know, uh, from early days of, uh, you know, web. And now uh, with these single page applications, you basically end up not using these uh, functionalities. 
But recently, they have uh, done a lot of uh, work on these frameworks to make sure that these fun these basically buttons will still work, but they're not really doing their job as they were supposed to. They're basically uh, mimicking the functionality. But really, when you click on the back button, you're not really going to a different URL. You're just going to the previous state, and that's basically a trick that you do in the in the JavaScript to to make that happen. But really. Um, you know, the, when you envision this um, in the near future, you probably will start seeing the back and forward button may, may start disappearing from the browsers, even the refresh buttons. You know, as you can see now, they're basically turning to a very tiny buttons because, you know, uh, they want to um, kind of emphasize on the fact that these buttons are going away because the single page applications would not need any back forward or refresh buttons. Um, Essentially, uh, the idea is to get the uh, web experience like just like mobile app experience. Like when you have an application on your phone, um, you really don't have back forward and refresh buttons inside those applications, right? So the web is actually going towards that with a with single page application concept. But it, this technology also has its own drawbacks. Um, of course, there are a lot more work for JavaScript. We have to be worried about the security because now you're getting all the data from the server. The server really doesn't care what the client is. So when you are writing that application, you have to be very careful about the security aspect of your application because now you have more responsibility on the client side. You have to protect um, the data, uh, who needs to see what, and all of that will happen on the client side. Also, you have to be worried about the memory management because now you're loading all, everything to, to your browser, which essentially is your client side. You have to be concerned about uh, the, the memory on the device. And also, you have to kind of manage the navigation. Also, um, uh, the, the performance really uh, uh, can, can be related to your client. So if you're using a very outdated laptop um, you will get some performance problems, and we can see that those things, you know, in, in modern web today, and and, and you know, which wasn't the case in the past. If if you were exploring the web ten years ago, uh, you really with any kind of computer, you could explore the web um, as long as you had a good internet connection. You didn't have any problems. But today, even with the best internet act, internet speed, you still might experience performance issues if your computer is not well capable you know from a processing perspective and memory perspective all right because now you know your browser does the most heavy lifting so it requires your uh, computer to be more powerful and also if if the design is in a way that uh, the whole application needs to be loaded on the first you know on the first uh, load in a single page application and if it's not designed properly it may end up with a, with a slow time. Uh, just a quick uh, hint, if you've seen Salesforce, you've probably experienced the time that you see the logo in the middle of the page that you know uh, usually changes between releases that will stay on for like four or five seconds sometimes. And that's where you know you usually Salesforce is trying to load the entire application. And uh, you know uh, over time, we've seen that Salesforce has kind of uh, broken that part down into multiple areas of the page so sometimes you see that sometimes you don't but but that's essentially where you know you get bootstrapping uh, from the server so all right and uh over time when the single page application concept came in um, we started seeing um, different frameworks that implement this idea of single page application we see things like backbone spine js can js AmberJS, Angular is one of the most, uh, I guess, famous one, and Meteor. So you see these frameworks coming into the picture, and they're just uh, uh, JavaScript frameworks that implement uh, certain features that enables web to be a single page, uh, a web application to be a single page application. And they do things like routing, and uh, let's say, um, you know, the security and binding with the variables and things like that. They're all basically part of the different frame, these frameworks, uh, basically enabling your web application to, um, to be a, a single page application, all right? Okay, 
So now, um, having said about you know th those frameworks, uh, we see a framework called Aura. Aura framework is basically a single page application framework, just like the other frameworks. Uh, think about Angular, you've probably heard about that. Aura is basically just the same framework uh, written by Salesforce. And uh, what it does is basically allows you to build components that are reusable and, uh, and will work in a single page application concept. And these uh, components can communicate with each other through events. And that's what, uh, you know, you probably see different places that saying, you know, um, uh, Aura Framework or Lightning, which I'll, I'll cover in the next slide, is an event-driven architecture. What that means is that these components can communicate with each other through events. And one thing that I want to make sure that everybody understands here is that events are not messagings. So messaging is slightly different than events. So events are sort of like a broadcast uh, messaging. So what happens is that, you know, just like your TV broadcast or radio broadcast, um, a, a component can say out loud uh, whenever something happens and some other components can basically subscribe to listen to that, basically just like your TV or your radio that they can tune in into a specific station to, to listen or hear what what being said in that uh, basically station. Um, there are no direct, like uh, the broadcaster doesn't know if you're listening to that or if you're not listening to that, you know, uh, broadcast. But at the same time, you know, um, only you know that you're listening to that uh, event. So that's basically the way these components communicate with each other. Think about it like a room that people are in that room and you're just listening to whoever you're interested at. and other people would just talk out loud without knowing that who is listening to them right so that's basically how these components on a page can communicate with each other um, to kind of uh, send and receive information between them so that's basically the basics of uh, basics of aura framework so now we get to the you know what we wanted to talk about salesforce lightning framework Right, we said all of these stories to get to this point, uh, and Lightning Framework is essentially an implementation of Aura Framework on Salesforce platform. So um, Salesforce could basically pick Angular and implement it in Salesforce and call it Salesforce Lightning, uh, but instead they wrote their own, which was Aura, and they basically implemented Aura on Salesforce and called it Salesforce Lightning. All right, and um, the way it works is that they kind of wired uh, the Aura to work with the Salesforce backend, which is your Apex that you are you all are familiar with, to be able to communicate with the front end. Um, just a quick thing about Aura: Aura can communicate with any kind of backend. It's a generic framework. It's written to communicate with, the, let's say, Java backend or any kind of backend that you write. But when Salesforce implements Aura in Salesforce, they essentially created um, the connectors that will connect that framework to the backend uh, native of Salesforce, which is Apex, right? That's, that, that's the meaning of implementation of Aura on the Salesforce platform, which allows you to build applications, including Lightning Experience, and also your Salesforce One mobile app. Right. And that's how they started, really. When they built the Salesforce One mobile app, they used the Aura framework behind the scene. No one probably knew at the time that what that technology is when Salesforce first released the Salesforce One mobile app. And then essentially when the Lightning experience came out, Salesforce officially announced that, yeah, the technology behind Salesforce One and Lightning experience is um, the Aura framework that we've been kind of working on throughout the years. So essentially, that's the that's the engine behind both Lightning Experience and Salesforce One, and also it's the engine behind the platform which allows you to build your Lightning component on the on the on, on the you know on the Salesforce Lightning um, platform. All right. Okay. And um, this is a little bit of a diagram that shows um, how these components, uh, when they're implemented in Salesforce, communicate with the back end of Salesforce. All right. So now let's look at the architecture. Um, when we look at the architecture of Salesforce Classic, 
this is what you guys are most familiar with. Um, you have a pretty large backend to the Salesforce, and that's the multi-tenant, uh, you know, uh, platform that uh, provides services, um, you know, for, for the clients. So when you look really on the on, under under the hood, Salesforce has its own database, which is a heap data model, and then there is a platform that translates all those, you know, uh, um, records and the way Salesforce stores data to to what you can see in the Salesforce UI. And there is uh, a business logic built into it, which is called Apex, which is what you know you build or you write your Apex classes and triggers. And then uh, there is a layer called uh, you know Visual Force Page. Um, I want to make sure that everybody understands that Visual Force Page is a server technology, is not a client technology. So when you write your Visual Force Pages, it actually gets compiled on the server side. Uh, which are Salesforce servers. And when they get compiled, they get to what we call like HTML and JavaScript and CSS. And that portion will be sent to the client. And all your browser does is renders that information on the page. So your, your browser is basically doing nothing. This is the classic of the web. This is the web that you know uh, we've seen over you know from 1990s all the way to late 2008-9. So, um, so really, the heavy lifting of everything happens on the server side. Your business logic, which is basically your Apex, handles you know the creation of uh, a lot of different uh, variables and attributes. And then your Visual Force page utilizes those information from its own controller to build the page. And then the page just gets delivered to your uh, browser. And then you know when uh, when mobiles uh, mobile devices started emerging. Uh, Salesforce started building what they used to call Salesforce Classic mobile application, which essentially had to communicate with Salesforce through an API. And that mobile application had to kind of have its own UI and built natively uh, on the, you know, on the, on the, on the platform. So they had, they, they were only supporting uh, Salesforce on the iOS devices at the time. Right. So as uh, you know, all these devices started growing, and you know, we started having different tablets, you know, um, like iPads and Android tablets, and started having different phones like Android, and you know, we started seeing like Windows phones and iOS phones, different form factors. Salesforce decided that okay, now um, you know, with this classic model, we're not able to just move forward because we can't just const constantly build a native application for different devices, and uh, let our server, um, you know, to handle these different form factors. So they started building the Aura framework, which is basically our single page application uh, framework, and came up with this architecture, which is a lightning architecture. And as you can see, the server has shrunk significantly. The server has turned to a database with just a layer that would provide data, which are essentially the same thing as Apex, but now we call them like Aura controller. Which, which basically provides information to a client. But then that business logic that you used to see on the back end now is moved to the, front, you know, to the front end, which is basically your client. So the business logic is what you see as lightning, lightning controllers and helpers, which, which are written in JavaScript, which essentially a uh, browser side uh, you know, language. So you, you write it on, you know, on, the, on the Salesforce platform, but what happens is that the code, as they have been written, gets transferred to the client. And your client, which is your browser, essentially compiles. It doesn't compile, but it basically interprets that code into the you know, uh, functionality and then decides what to do when uh, on the client side itself. And also, the UI is all gets boost, bootstrapped on your client side. So essentially, when you look at this, again, you know, going back to my definition, uh, server doesn't really care who is looking at this information. Server doesn't know if if this is a if this is a Salesforce one, if this is a Lightning experience, if this is a standard component, if this is a custom component. The server all it does is just provides that information, and the client decides what to do with that information and how to display the information on the page. So now you got more responsibility to handle information on the client side and build that business logic on the client side efficiently and securely to make sure that you are uh, providing a best user experience 
depending on what device is being uh, used uh, to view the information. All right, so now putting, putting these two together, um, you'll see that we're moving from a really what we call like a fat server to the thin server and from a thin client to a fat client. And that's really the change that we've been seeing uh, over the years, you know, uh, recent years happening into a lot of these web pages and web applications. So with this, Salesforce has a big advantage. Um, number one is that their server uh, is going to be shrunk significantly, which is which is one of the great benefits from Salesforce. You know, um, they get a lot of ROI off of that. But at the same time, you get a lot of benefit because now you don't have to write too many things on the server to support different uh, different devices. You basically write the logic all on the client side and handle everything on the client side. And really, if 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 you have heard things like lightning is slow, lightning is you know sluggish, lightning is you know not as you know fast as you know they, they promised. That's all because of the client uh, is taking a lot of responsibility here. And one of the one of the hopes is that as we move uh, forward in time, we start seeing more even more powerful clients as you can see you know browsers are getting updated almost uh, you know every every month with a new version and they're getting more powerful just because they want to catch up with this change and they want to they want to be very much more powerful to be able to provide that experience on the client side all right so now the question is how do we uh, properly take advantage of uh, this lightning platform so knowing that lightning is a technology upgrade um, one of the things that, uh, you know, uh, most of the times we tell clients is that you're not look, just looking at this box here, which is uh, UI enhancements, but what you have to look is all these, you know, uh, five areas. One and the most important is the process improvements. Um, most of the times uh, we, we say that, you know, switching to Lightning, uh, even though you can click on switch to Lightning and switch to Lightning and in the, in the best case scenario, everything will be supported. But really, you have to look at your processes because, because you know, you don't want to replicate the same exact functionality that you had in Classic in Lightning. Uh, we're not just changing the technology, but we want to take advantage of that technology, right? So a lot of people think about Lightning as one of the things that we got to do. But that's not really the benefit. The benefit is when you actually go back to your processes and try to figure out how I can change my processes to be more effective when I use when I basically use this new technology. For example, you know, um, in the classic, when you create a new uh, opportunity, uh, you may see like 500 fields on the opportunity page. Uh, we've seen this quite frequently with clients that they have a large number of fields in the opportunity object. And when they click new, they'll see, you know, all of those fields. But really what the salesperson uh, intends to do on creating a new opportunity is fill up only five fields. They just want to put the new name of the opportunity, maybe just the first, uh, you know, um, estimation of the value and, you know, some basic information. But then, you know, they, they're faced with the 500 fields and they always complain like, you know, um, this is not the best way. When you switch to Lightning, you might see the same thing, but but the best thing to do is look at that process. Maybe I only need to expose those only five fields that the salesperson needs in the Lightning. Uh, and then they can, uh, you know, after they create the opportunity, they can go back in and fill up the rest of those information. So, you know, with that, you know, we improve the process we improve the experience really for the for the for the end user and make them more productive. So so that's really what we need to look at. Some of the processes can change the way people use the system can dramatically change when we go from classic to lightning. Like in classic, when you wanted to change the stage of uh, opportunity, you had to go in and change the pick list to you know one stage to another. But in lightning, you can actually click on what they call a path to move from one stage to another. But keep in mind, all of those are, you know, part of the process. We can also look at our architectural improvements. We can look at our mobility capabilities, user functionality, and UI enhancement. So we have to look at all these five different areas when we do lightning migration. So um, to accomplish this, um, we started kind of thinking at Berlisoft that how we can basically build a approach that would actually um, 
accomplish our goals. So most of the times when we when we see, face a project, we'll we'll try to kind of do a little discovery and estimate the project, and then give the proposal, and then just go ahead and do the project, right? Um, but with Lightning, um, that's not the case because we don't know the processes, and we want to understand the processes, the architecture, all the capabilities, and things like that, and then try to redesign the uh, the experience and the architecture and then go about implementing that. So uh, to accomplish that, we decided to take a two-phase approach. So uh, the phase one is uh, what we call advisory service, which we what we will do in this phase is we do the discovery, we do the analysis, and then we'll go about redesigning and then giving or providing the client with a mark migration plan. The migration plan is basically a comprehensive uh, plan of what needs to be done and how we're going to change things, including all the process changes and all the you know changes that we need to do to the user experience and so forth. And that by itself is is a project that it has its own statement of work and it's basically by you know has its own deliverables. And then the phase two, which is basically another project, is actually implementing things that we define in the migration plan, which is, starts with a build and transform rollout trainings and optimization, right? So this allows us to um, easily estimate for the advisory. And then once the advisory is completed, we can estimate easily for the delivery of that uh, you know, uh, migration. So this two-phase approach uh, is very useful. Uh, things that we do in this, uh, in this process is you know, starting with the discovery. We have a, a product internally built in Bielosoft called TrueLens. TrueLens is essentially a tool that run, basically extracts all the metadata from the client's org. It allows us to do a deep analysis of uh, all the customizations that you have done into your org. And they, uh, gives us a lot of uh, you know, uh, groundwork to uh, kind of do the analysis. Uh, we get a lot of uh, artifacts, um, documentation, and things like that uh, about your org. And also we run the lightning readiness check that you guys are most familiar with from Salesforce. We put these two reports together and then we go about doing the process review. Uh, we sit with the business, or we listen to, uh, or we actually sit with uh, people that do the work in Salesforce to kind of watch how they uh, run their business on a day-to-day -day basis with Salesforce and kind of understand um, where the pain points are and where the adoption issues are and come up with a set of requirements that we think uh, is appropriate to make changes uh, when we decide to go to Lightning. And then we start doing the analysis, which includes the technical analysis and functional analysis. We look at the process improvements and the gap analysis, which essentially means um, what are the things that we need to kind of come up with a different approach because Lightning is a different technology. And this, at this stage, we also look at all of the things like Visual Force pages and some of the more technical stuff like JavaScript buttons, and, you know, home pages, overrides, hard coded URLs, and also your app exchange apps and things like that. So after analysis and design, we come up with a migration plan, which essentially summarizes all the things that we came up with in during the analysis and design. Um, essentially, it gives us uh, an iterative build and rollout plan. Um, even our trainings in internal communication plan. This basically is a blueprint of the project that needs to be done as a second phase, which is our agile delivery. And what we essentially do in agile delivery is basically delivering what we promised in, into, the, into the migration plan. We go about building this in an agile uh, methodology. We start planning for the sprints and then go about executing those sprints, which includes building building light, lightning components and transforming things like visual force pages and things like that, updating the processes and all of the things that needs to be changed. And then uh, we do our internal QA, client QA and sprint demos. And when it gets to rollout, we basically um, have to plan for user acceptance testing. Um, once that's completed, we go about executing our rollout strategy. All of these are defined into the migration plan that you know uh, I mentioned before. And then essentially uh, execute that, 
and once once that's completed after all the sprints for the for the delivery uh, we start by enabling pilot users and super users uh, to go in start uh, working in the system and uh, start communicating with the internal uh, um, uh, basically employees that we're going to migrate this and uh, one of the things that we do normally is uh, like internal marketing to make sure everybody's excited about the change and uh, and and then we start rolling out um, by enabling them enabling the lighting experience for groups of users with that uh, we are almost uh, three quarter of hours on the it's uh, 10 45 my time so I'm going to open this up for questions uh, if you have any questions I'll be happy to uh, take a month Excellent. Thank you, Bijan. We do have some questions. Uh, the first question is specific to Visual Force. Uh, will all Visual Force pages need to be updated? Very good question. Um, so uh, when I talked about a different architecture and when I talked about uh, what we went from, how we went from a classic to lightning, you probably saw that I did not include the classic architecture inside lightning architecture and and that means that in real lightning technology visual force does not exist but when you look at the salesforce as a company as a uh what what i still call it a software that they have they still support both classic and lightning which means that they still support both architectures uh, Salesforce Classic would not go anywhere uh, anytime um, soon. I would say soon uh, with codes that I would say that soon will probably means uh, forever. And that means uh, sales. And the, the reason I'm saying that is because not only uh, a lot of clients are going to continue using in Classic, but also um, the technology itself still has use cases that makes it more appropriate. Um, some of the use cases really um, should be done in a classic way. And that's the most appropriate architecture for them, especially when it comes to certain uh, sensitive handling of data, you still wanna do them in a visual force way. So Salesforce, uh, when they started kind of marketing Lightning, Salesforce kind of started saying that, well, you know, let's go out and change the Visual Force pages to Lightning components. And everybody started kind of uh, getting scared, like, oh, we have to change all of our Visual Force pages to Lightning components. Then Salesforce realized that maybe that wasn't the correct statement to market because Visual Force page and that classic architecture is going to be a valid architecture in the future. So it's not, it's not the best architecture, but still has to be there because there are some valid use cases. So no, the answer to your question is not all the visual force pages needs to be convert, converted to lightning components, but, it, but you have to think about the, your use cases. Uh, Salesforce has made a lot of efforts in the recent releases to make sure that they can have a way to make your visual force pages at least look like Salesforce lightning and follow the lightning design experience so that you can continue using visual force pages seamlessly with lightning components. And they have uh, different technologies like visual force page in lightning components and lightning components inside visual force pages and various different ways of kind of incorporating visual force pages in lightning so that people uh, stop thinking about the fact that visual force pages are going away. No, the answer is visual force pages would not go away there will be still a valid uh, architecture, but we have to look at uh, you know, um, what we have today. And that's what we do as part of the analysis to see if that visual force page should continue being the visual force page or it should change to a lightning component. One of the examples is that if you have an inline visual force page in your Salesforce Classic, uh, most likely you will change that to a lightning component because that that's the best case uh, to change a visual force page to, to a lightning component. But if you have a full page of lightning, oh, oh, I'm sorry, a visual force page that does a specific calculation, uh, most likely you just want to 
make sure that that looks like lightning and keep it as is because you know really you're not going to embed that with other components in one single page so again you know we have to look at use cases but short answer to your question is no visual force page would not go away and will continue being uh, a valid technology okay thank you you may have addressed some of these questions already but i'll go ahead and um, ask them uh, how easy is it to build a lightning web page so lightning web page um, uh, essentially what salesforce has done uh, is that um, they kind of uh, you know the philosophy in salesforce is always to move from code to configuration like from uh, code to clicks so they've made a lot of uh, improvements in a way that you create a page and today for the most part what you will do is creating a page is all declarative with lightning app builder but but your components needs to be uh, created uh, programmatically so you you essentially built your components uh, if they're custom components of course um, but there are also there is also app exchange for lightning components just the same way you have app exchange for apps you can download components from that app exchange or you can write your own which are all written in JavaScript um, and of course uh, HTML and then, um, and then you basically create a page consisting of various different components. And these components, again, as I mentioned, can communicate with each other through events. So you have to be kind of uh, thinking in advance what this component can broadcast and what other components can listen to. So, um, so that you, know, you can provide that kind of user experience that uh, is very uh, fluid and responsive. Okay. What is the best practice for converting Visual Force pages to Lightning? So the best practice, um, I've, I've seen it's, it's very interesting. Um, I remember uh, about, like, I think it was less than a year ago, um, someone sent me a link to a web page that they claimed that they wrote a, uh, like a black box that you can actually give it a visual force page and it will spit out a lightning component and i kind of laughed when i when i saw that and i and i said you know uh people are using all kinds of tricks to 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 kind of say that well you know you can convert a visual force page to lightning component there is no conversion so we're talking about apples and oranges here so um so really uh you know uh, uh you know in this webinar i tried to kind of um, make sure everybody understands that there are two different technologies, there are two different architectures, and from the, their core, they are different. They, they're not even on the, you know, they're, they're even handled by different uh, engines, right? I mean, Lightning is all handled by your client side, Classic is all handled, or Visual Force is all, always handled by your server side. So really, um, there is no conversion in between. So what needs to happen is that you have to look at that visual force page you have to really go back to the whiteboard and really understand the functionality that happens in a visual force page and build that functionality uh, um, as if it was a new requirement on the new technology which is the lighting so um again it's all starting from scratch it's all starting from whiteboard all the visual force will give you is what the functionality is today. And even with that, um, you're not replicating an enlightening component because the technology is different. Again, you have to look at the business process and th there might be uh, that situation that you convert one visual force page to five different lightning components. Or maybe there, there could be a use case that you're converting five visual force pages into one single lightning component. So you have to think about how that you know the architecture can really benefit you, and how that communication can work. Sometimes you know um, one of the things we had in one of the trainings is, was that you know when you have a page with a list of uh, let's say images and, and and a search box in a Visual Force page uh, kind of technology, you put the search box and all of your list of your images into one single Visual Force. But in Lightning, it's best if you create a component for your search box and a component for your list of images and 
essentially that search box and the list of images will communicate with each other through events. That allows you to put the search box anywhere on the page you want declaratively and the list of images anywhere in the page you want, again, declaratively with the app builder. But they can always communicate with each other. So if the user is complaining, saying, hey, this search box is not in the right place, an admin can go in and move it you know, to the top of the page. And these components will continue talking to each other uh, through events. Um, but you, you change it all declaratively. All right. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip around here for a second. Uh, is client side validation less secure than server side? If so, how do you protect the customer's data? Right. So, um, very great question. Um, you do want to do client side verification um, that protects uh, at least the first line of defense. But with Lightning technology, you do want to always do the back end server side verification as well. And the reason I'm saying this is because, uh, and it's and it's a lot more important than the Visual Force page in the classic time. Because in the classic Salesforce, Visual Force page always gets compiled on the server side. So even when you're submitting a, uh, a page, still Salesforce has the full control of those values before they go into the back end, right? But in the, in, in, the, in the Lightning technology, even if you do client side validation, but the server probably doesn't know anything about what you have done. I can probably write a client side that communicates with the back end of the Salesforce in Angular, right? So Salesforce doesn't know what I'm doing in Angular. Salesforce doesn't know if I'm uh, validating or not validating. And I can essentially try to hack the system by not validating and push malicious uh, values to the back end of Salesforce. And if you do not have server side validation, um, you're basically insecure and your server can be in jeopardy. So what you really need to do is you on a, on a lightning, uh, you know, as I mentioned, uh, you've got more responsibilities because now you have to do both client side validation and the server side validation to make sure that your uh, application is pretty secure. Okay. Right. And we are right at the 11 a.m. Mark, we do have two additional questions. Um, I believe you may have covered them, um, Bijan. One, one is about the basic points of migrating from classic to light. Um, sorry, migrating from classic to lightning, and the other is how to navigate from one component to another. So, so you are basically not navigating from one component to another. Components are basically different boxes that you have on the page. So. Um, so let me uh, try to kind of get back up to one of these uh, diagrams. So this one here. So really, when you look at your page, you have different components on one single page. So you don't navigate from this component to this component. You see the components that are rendered on one single page. When you move from uh, one lightning application, lightning page to another lightning page is when you actually create a new tab and uh, a new, uh, basically, uh, um, a new uh, functionality per se. So um, remember, Lightning Framework is a single page application. When I say single page, it means that you're really not moving between the pages. Everything is in one single page. So these components can be displayed or they can be hidden from the page or they can morph to a different, uh, you know, uh, functionality all within one single page. So you're not really supposed to go from one page to another page unless you're opening a new tab with a completely new functionality, which is basically uh, another area of your application, you know. But but even even that is, as a, you know, if you look, you know, components are kind of like nested. If, even with that, there is like a larger page as a Salesforce page that includes your Lightning pages. So pages are kind of nested to each other as well, same way as components are nested to each other. Hope that makes sense. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Bijan. We are at 11.02 right now. 
So uh, if there are no additional questions, we will close the webinar out. I do want to thank everyone for attending today. You will receive an email in your inbox within the next day with a recording to this of this session, as well as some contact information. If you are interested in seeking additional services or you do have some questions, we will provide you with some contact information there that you can get in touch with us. All right. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Have a great evening.